The Monroe Doctrine is an early cornerstone of U.S. foreign policy. It is steeped in ideas of dismantling colonialism and shifting global power dynamics in the 19th century. Its origins are simultaneously simple and complex. Let's start by meeting James Monroe. Before he became the fifth president of the United States, he fought and was wounded in the American Revolution, served in state and federal government, and held several diplomatic posts. Through it all, he believed firmly in the American experiment. And a doctrine is a principle or idea that influences a government's actions. Doctrines can become part of a country's foreign policy. The Monroe Doctrine began as part of an elaborate speech Monroe gave in 1823. So how did he get there? In 1812, the United States fought and won the Second War against the British. This win showed powerful European nations that America could defend and maintain its independence. But American independence was also tied to addressing the political volatility in its neighborhood. South of the United States, colonies in Latin America were fighting and winning their own independence from the Spanish Empire. Between 1821 and 1822 alone, 10 former colonies forged new nations. The United States couldn't afford to take a wait-and-see attitude. Could these new Latin American countries keep Europeans from recolonizing them? Somebody had to say something. But would anything the U.S. president had to say really make a difference? It's tricky. Monroe recognized the need to support Latin American independence. But at this point, the United States was not a global superpower. Its economy and military were no match for the Europeans. Enter the greatest naval power in the world, Great Britain. Great Britain wanted to trade with the new Latin American nations and was also keeping an eye on the competition from mainland Europe. They knew firsthand that empires are expensive to maintain. The British were not interested in any recolonization schemes, but they worried about others and even offered to make a joint statement with the Americans, warning Europeans to stay away from the Western Hemisphere. Monroe and his advisors knew that Great Britain would provide the naval might to back up a statement. The offer to issue a joint statement was very tempting. But would a joint statement make the United States look weak? Some of Monroe's advisors did not think so. They argued that teaming up with the British was how the United States could be taken seriously by the other European powers. But Secretary of State John Quincy Adams disagreed. Like Monroe, he remembered America's hard-fought victories against the British. Adams told the president that riding on the coattails of the British was no way to establish dominance in its own neighborhood. Adams also saw this as an opportunity to reaffirm America's strong, independent foreign policy. Wise leaders consider all points of view before making a decision. Ultimately, Monroe agreed with his Secretary of State. In a speech to Congress on December 2, 1823, he made the United States' position clear. Monroe declared the Western Hemisphere closed to future colonization. He also reminded the Europeans that any interference in the Americas would be considered a hostile act against the United States. In effect, this bound the security and economic interests of the United States with that of the new Latin American nations. But what Monroe did not say in his speech was just as important. He did not lay out a plan of action should the Europeans ignore the warning because when in reality, there wouldn't be much the United States could do. However, the presence of American diplomats throughout Latin America did help forge new alliances. Diplomats built relationships with Latin Americans and provided valuable intelligence back to Washington regarding European ambitions in the region. As it turns out, while both the United States and European nations did eventually interfere in the affairs of independent Latin American nations, it would be America that cast its imperial arm over the Western Hemisphere at the dawn of the 20th century. Though there was one significant difference from Monroe's time, there would be no question the United States could now back up its words with military and commercial might.